It's an honor to be asked to speak to all of you. Uh, I have a couple of admissions to make. However, I am not a data scientist. I'm a lawyer. Um, so that's one reason you're not going to want to hug me anyway. Uh, more to the point, uh, I'm a former prosecutor. I started my career here in Manhattan with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And I run a team of data scientists. Uh, collectively, their ages are all younger than the belt I'm wearing uh, right now. <laughs> Uh, but they're fantastic. And what we do uh, in the skunk works that I've built uh, out of the mayor's office is take all of the massive amounts of information that we as a city collect about our businesses and locations and use that to allocate our resources more effectively. So how do we do that? One example that I've talked about a lot publicly, so I'm not going to do it here, uh, at length anyway, is we have a big problem in New York City with illegal conversions. What, what's an illegal conversion? It's an apartment where a landlord chops up a space that is zoned safely for six and crams 60 into it. And based on the numbers that are here today, some number of you, I guarantee, are living in conditions that are contrary to the certificate of occupancy issued by the Department of Buildings. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not worried about uh, that issue right now. But that problem ends up correlating with a lot of catastrophic bad things for the city, including fire and crime and waste and rats and all kinds of things that make your day-to-day -day lives miserable. However, we get roughly 20,000 complaints a year for that, and we only have about 200 some odd inspectors to throw at those 20,000 complaints. So. What my team did was deconstruct those complaints, those uh, illegal conversions that were likeliest to also have an increased risk of a catastrophic outcome. And how did we deconstruct that? We basically took all of the little bits of information that we as a city know about those locations. How old's the building? How many rats does it have uh, from the complaints? Uh, how, uh, what's the financial condition of either the structure or the owner? and then cross-tabulated that with fire, and we found a number of very fascinating things, one of which was if a property has a tax lien on it, it is nine times more likely to sustain a serious structural fire. Moreover, that property, that illegally converted structure, if it does catch fire and the fire department responds, which they will, the fire department is 15 times more likely to have one of its members injured or killed during the response to that fire. That's all really bad stuff. So what do we do? We rank them. We take those 20,000, we find the 5% that rest within our historic profile, and then send them back out to those 200 inspectors to go to first. And it's been extraordinarily effective. Historically speaking, the city of New York finds conditions that are so serious when they show up and do inspections at these locations about 13% of the time. That's been over about a four or four and a half year period. Uh, ever since we started doing what we're doing in terms of just a simple ranking method by catastrophe likelihood, uh, we're at 80%. That is a five-fold increase on man hour, inspection man hour investment for the city of New York. That's wonderful, and it didn't cost us a nickel. Those five kids I was talking about that were younger than my belt, they came up with it. And they came up with it not on any really sophisticated machines. We started out using Microsoft Excel. We graduated to SQL about six months ago. Uh, and now we have uh, some assistance from some, uh, some of the sponsors here today, uh, including Palantir, but, so that we can do it more broadly. But the fact of the matter is it's been extraordinarily effective. Moreover, it's been implemented. That's what we do. We implement. We are the get shit done people. So it's not just looking at the problem. I go back out to the agencies because I work directly for the most powerful mayor, I think, in the country, and tell them we need to be doing this. But I don't do it in a way that's like iron-fisted pounding the table. You guys got to start doing this. I do it in a way that makes sense to them economically to do. The Department of Buildings is thrilled that they've got a five-fold increase on uh, uh, man hour return. The fire department is thrilled that we're going to the places and preventing fires where their people get injured and killed. The police department likes it because it's a, these illegal conversions also co uh, correlate with a lot of crime. The Department of Health likes it because these places generate rats. So 
all of this makes sense economically to our agencies, and it's all done simply through the data science uh, approaches that all of you take day to day. So that ramble uh, is the kickoff point. I'm going to go to something decidedly less sexy, grease disposal. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 25,000 restaurants that are registered with the Department of Health. Those letter grades in the window are generated by a city agency, letter grades that the restaurant tours despise. But what they tell you is whether or not it's safe to eat there. Now, pretty much every restaurant in town has those uh, little fry buckets, right? Where you put the fries in, it goes into the fryer, it bubbles up, whatever. That generates yellow grease. That yellow grease is supposed to be disposed of a certain way. When it is not disposed of a certain way, it causes us problems across the board. DEP is the Department of Environmental Protection. It's kind of our fancy word for the water department. They make sure that the pipes run that they don't burst, and that the water that you pour out of your tap is drinkable. Uh, when you dump grease into the sewer or improperly anywhere, it backs that up and it impacts us as a city. BIC, the Business Integrity Commission, uh, it's one of my favorite little agencies that nobody knows about. Uh, historically speaking, New York City, surprise, has organized crime issues in its waste hauling industry. So the Business Integrity <laughs> Commission so the Business Integrity Commission is set up specifically to make sure that private waste haulers are not, you know, in the Sopranos. Uh, how do they do that? BIC only services those waste haulers. Um, so, so we got two waste haulers, I'm sorry. We have the Department of Sanitation of New York, also known as Disney, hilariously enough. And then we have the Business Integrity Commission. Disney services residents. So getting back to where you live and why it's important, if your place is zoned residential, Disney will serve you. If you are living in Bushwick in a converted industrial building, you've got to go to BIC, which means you're going to a private waste hauler that's registered with BIC. So I know, as a city, about them. That problem, however, is that not everybody registers with BIC. So you know, when somebody's dumping grease, however, that's who BIC would go to. BIC deals with restaurants, not residents. Right? Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, that's who I was talking about with the letter grades. You dump in your grease improperly, it probably correlates with a lot of other epidemiological issues generated at your restaurant. It's just simple guesswork. Uh, fire Department, of course, dumping grease. Grease is a, a fire accelerant. Uh, it, is a, it is an issue. Moreover, there's these overhead fan hoods uh, that go over every oven. Uh, FDNY goes in and inspects every one of those. Uh, finally, economic development. We don't want to bang up our small restaurants. These are our entrepreneurs. We care very deeply about them. They generate half the job growth in this city. So we don't want to walk in and issue them up to a $20,000 fine because they're not dumping their, their uh, waste material appropriately. There's other ways to go with them. We can educate them. And how do we do that? There's another industry that loves yellow grease. And that's the biodiesel industry. Sometimes you see their trucks driving around. They you know, convert, I don't know how they do it, but they convert that yellow grease into something you can put in your car. And it smells like french fries instead of exhaust. <laughs> we as a city love that industry for a number of reasons. First off, we are trying to reduce our carbon footprint every way we can. Moreover, it's a new company. It's innovative. It's great. So it's a twofer for us to link up those small business people with this nascent biodiesel industry. So how do we do that? What's the relevant data? The relevant data is from the Department of Environmental, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, their, their catch basin. So if a catch basin is the, the graded sewer in the street, if that's clogged, DEP has that data. And it's actually wonderfully clean. It's all down to the XY. Uh, BIC has restaurants that are getting their waste hauled by a licensed hauler. And that, that becomes relevant in a second. And then finally, DOHMH has the licensed restaurant locations. However, we have tech, uh, ontology issues here in New York City. If I say where I am, you're going to get into this fascinating ontological conversation, right? If I go to the Department of Finance, they're going to tell me a tax lot called a BBL, a borough block and lot. Why? Because they care about taxing the, the property. If I go to the Department of Buildings, they're going to give me a building identification number or a BIN. Why? Because they're concerned with structural integrity. If I go to the fire department or the police department, they're going to give me two different versions of latitude and longitude. Why? Because they have to get directly to some point. Right? This is emergency services. 
So if I show up, I got to go directly to some place, not just some general delineated lot, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and DOHMH uses the postal address. Uh, there's about 19 other different ways to say where I am in the city, and it all depends on what the agency is. So, uh, and they actually make sense, by the way. It, it, these, these languages weren't designed for you people. <laughs> they were designed specifically to let the agency deliver whatever widget it delivers. Now, we just have to kind of work around that. So what my people have managed to do is basically just draw a little dot, depending on the lift, depending on the project, do a little radius check, and then pull in all the relevant data, whatever the taxonomy. So that's how we tie this together. So this is a heat map of big grease pickups. This is where we know there are registrations. And those registrations are reporting this much gallonage. Manhattan, unsurprisingly, because it's got the most restaurants, has the highest gallonage of legitimate biodiesel disposal. Staten Island has the lowest. But that is not the whole picture. And it's not how we would go about allocating our resources. And by resources, what do I mean? So you've got BIC inspectors who are going to go out and check those stickers on the window that they're supposed to have saying that they, they went with a waste hauler. You've got DEP inspectors who will go out to the catch basins and make sure that they're not clogged and then find out who in the area is clogging them. And then you've got DOHMH and FDNY, et cetera, who are supposed to go in and make sure that the restaurant itself is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But I, all of those entities have a limited number of people, and we've got to send them where the problems are. If we send them just scattershot, we're looking at you know, this colossus of New York City, and it just becomes some random mess with a bad ROI. We're, our, my job is to up their ROI. So this is just the big grease pickups. This is DOHMH restaurant locations. Again, Manhattan has the greatest density of restaurants, Staten Island the lowest. So it's just part of the picture. What becomes relevant for us is when we marry it all up. Those little black triangles are clogged manholes, clogged catch basins. So you can see that restaurants with no registered waste hauler, right? So they would be, wait, why is this not happening? There we go. So they would be the uh, restaurants that end up showing up in the blue, right? Because we don't know about them. It's the dog that didn't bark, right? We marry that up with the manholes. Those locations with no waste hauler, no recorded waste hauler for solid waste and burglary, so three and a half times more likely to have a problem manhole within 600 feet. Target. Target identified. So now I have a rhyme or reason to send our people where they need to go. I do not need, mean to pick on these three restaurants, by the way. I go to this one, the dim sum go-go, uh, pretty much every other day, which explains my physical condition. But <laughs> the highlighted part at the bottom there, that's a catch basin. And then over there are the restaurants. So those three, this is Chinatown. So it's right next to City Hall. Um, you can very easily see how at like 4 in the morning, somebody's going out and dumping a giant bucket down the drain. It's very easy to see that, right? That popped. We were able to identify that location because of this. So now, what do we do? We have an actionable outcome. That actionable outcome is we have an initial target list of restaurants within 150 feet of problematic manholes for Joint Business Integrity Commission and Department of Environmental Protection Inspection. Joint inspection, by the way, is a rare event, and it's a kind of a pain in the ass. Because you're talking about two entities that don't normally work together having them work together. It's doable, but it's rare. What's better is complementary action. Complementary action is DEP goes out on its own time and checks out which manholes are going to be problematic and where the problem is. BIC does the same thing, but they're working towards the same common goal, which is combating yellow grease. Okay, and it's much more doable. They don't have to work together, uh, but they can work in ways that are not conflicting. Um, so we have the target list. DEP and BIC have been going out. Their success rate varyingly for, uh, and by success I mean they go out to a location, they find a condition, they hit somebody up uh, with a citation or whatever, or rectify the situation. For each agency, it's anywhere between 15 and 30 percent, depending on the, the, the location. The places we sent them to was 95 percent hit rate. So. That's a wonderful return for the city of New York at no cost to all of you who are our lovely taxpayers. Uh, interestingly enough, it expands as you expand the radius. No surprise there. There's more restaurants that get sucked in the larger you make the, the circle. The really fascinating thing for me, though, is that last bit. What this also does is that instead of going into the restaurants and saying, you know, here's your $25,000 fine, thank you, for, thanks for playing, and then leaving, Believe it or not, we are not in this to generate revenue. We generate revenue in other ways. We generate revenue much better by taxation. So 
what we tried to do instead was sit down with the restaurants with a list of registered biodiesel companies and say, stop dumping your money down the drain. These people will pay you to pick this up. It's not going to cost you anything. Knock it off, right? Uh, they were very happy. And it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't, they did, you know, we didn't cost them anything. We didn't go in and say, here's your $25,000 fine. Instead, we generated revenue for them, OK? That revenue goes back into the location. They serve the citizens of New York better. And it doesn't cost the city a nickel. This is all great. These are wins, win, wins for all of us. So I'm going to go back to something I think is a little sexier. Um, those projects, we have about anywhere between 40 and 60 different projects like this going on at any given time. It sounds like a ton, but the reality is many of the, the same data sets come into play over and over and over again for us. So this is just a basic GIF file of EMS runs. Uh, within the city of New York. EMS, the FDNY runs the ambulance services. We get 45,000 911 calls a day. Uh, about 20 to 25,000 of those involve ambulance runs for any number of things, ranging from heart attack and choke, which is the highest level, means they've got to get out there right away, all the way down to somebody claiming that their air conditioner is busted and they want some help. That happens, okay? We have, at any given moment, 300 ambulances under our control. That's not the universe of ambulances, by the way. Hospitals have their own ambulances. There's an Orthodox Jewish service uh, called Hatzalah that also runs in certain locations. Um, but the universe of ambulances that we as a city control that a taxpayer funded is about 300 at any given time. They are pre-deployed around the city, right? By pre-deployed, I mean they're not sitting at the firehouse. The firehouse has to have one of them sitting there, but there's another one out and about within the fire precinct just in case, at all hours, idling, sitting there, reading comic books, whatever, getting ready to go. So, however, uh, it seemed that random, that, the, that where they sit and park had no rhyme or reason to where the concentration of emergency calls were coming from. So, Sa uh, Fire Commissioner Cassano asked my group to, and in part thanks to the work we were doing for illegal conversions, to take a look at the problem. And we were taking a look and we started, a lot of it involves field work. So we go out into the field and talk to the ambulance drivers. So first we take a look at the data and see what it sees and whether, who we should talk to and where we should, we should uh, focus our efforts. And then we went out and talked to the ambulance drivers and finally it, it appeared to all of our group, it's like this doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason where you guys go, it seems to change, like where you park. And, and they were all like, it all depends on where the coffee shop is. Because, and that makes sense, right? So you're sitting there in an ambulance for like five hours waiting for your turn to go, you would like to be near a bathroom and coffee. And that is a legitimate thing. That's reality. So instead of just sitting there and coming up with a map and then saying, you know, perfectly speaking, we expect our high problems broken down by temperature and day of the week and, you know, whatever, and we'll, we'll park it there, it, they'll just tell us to go to hell. They won't do it, you know? But if we put them next to a 24 hour coffee shop, then we win. <laughs> They'll want to be there. So what we did is we just did the same thing. Draw a simple radius, fold it in that DOHMH data I was telling you about at the beginning of this presentation. And so long as there's a 24-hour location that's still closer to where we expect the really bad stuff to happen, then we shave up to a minute off of our response times to the citizenry of this town that is sustaining a heart attack or a stroke. That's awesome. And that's all because we used our data more effectively. So uh, I mean, I love my job. It should be apparent. But the reality is we're enabled to do it because of the work that all of you do. We're deeply appreciative. Uh, and we're always looking for help. So uh, thanks very much for your time.